Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Snowy's Camping Show. Joined again by Ben and Lauren. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel on YouTube. We've got tons and tons of content on there now. And you can also join in on the conversation at the Snowy's Camping Show Facebook group, where both Lauren and I are on there uh, answering your questions. And in the instance that we can't answer your question, we try and get experts in who can. And we've done just that today because we're talking about full drive lighting. So lighting in the campsite, also a little bit of lighting on your car. And we've got some experts in from Hardcore. So on the line, we've got Zach and Steve. How are you guys? Very well. Good, How are thank you? you. Thanks for coming on board. Yeah, with we're, the episode. we're good, Zach. Thanks yeah, for yeah. asking. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Ben. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, professional production here. Um, <laughs> so forward drive lighting. But before we get into that, tell us a little bit about Hardcore because we sell loads of your products, um, both for lighting around the campsite. But we've also jumped in recently with a lot of lighting like um, that we've got in front of us here, spotlights for the car and area lights and that sort of thing, all sort of 12 volt based. But Tell us a little bit of background on hardcore and, and you guys and why you're the, the experts in the field. <laughs> it started started back in 2008 with uh, Kirk Buckley and Cameron Cross, both directors of hardcore now. Um, Kirk Buckley came from a building and construction background and Cameron came from an audio and sales background. And uh, Kirk was currently building his house um, out at Bucken and Cameron came round to install some audio in his house and they got onto the topic of lighting for boating because Kirk was a big fisher uh, mm. back then and, um, yeah, they had no real 12-volt lighting for boats. So that's when basically the, the first uh, boat light kit came out. Yeah, right. That's where hardcore, hardcore really started, started was yeah. boat light kits, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, and from there we yeah. No, go on. Sorry. <laughs> oh, and from there, we've, you know, tried to bring out products, um, quality products at a, you know, at affordable price. Um, and we've also tried to be very innovative as well. Um, so listening to our customer base. Um, so we do listen to them and their inquiries that they have about different things that would suit them as well. So, but that's been the biggest thing for Hardcore is being very innovative and bringing out quality products at affordable price. So, and I, I love, um, especially with your new new four-wheel driving range as well, you've got a couple of different, um, I guess you'd call them sort of price points or, mm. or levels of and options for lighting, which is great because it means that everybody can have access to that a qual- quality lighting regardless of sort of where their budget is as well, which is awesome. Yeah, that is a good option. Yeah. I'm interested, to, the name Hardcore, would, would did that, do, you, do you have a story behind where that came from or where that started? Originally core lighting yeah. um, and core lighting came from one of my uncles. He came over from New Zealand and Kirk showed him the stuff that they were working on and he walked into the, the shed at the time and said, core, that's pretty cool. So that's <laughs> where the, the core came from. Oh, that's yeah, great. Yeah, core. And yeah, then right. core, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and you just added that's the how that first name. And the heart yeah, just made it yeah, sound a bit more better. <laughs> Four-wheel drive. Yeah, yeah nice. hard core. Awesome. Is that, is that a New Zealand yeah. specific thing? Like I, I thought, uh, you know, core blimey, like that sort of thing was really yeah, old-fashioned. It, yeah. it very well could be. Very well could be. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so essentially how did from sort of boating, how did you move into more of a campsite uh, four-wheel drive vehicle lighting space? So the next was camp lighting. They were, well, Kirk mostly was a, a camper mm-hmm. and um, we camped couple of times a year and we had, you know, the, uh, the old gas lanterns, um, nothing 12 volt, nothing was around back then. Mm. Um, so I guess they just started importing different types of LED lighting and, and found a, a use for it in, in the camping environment. Yeah, right. So on camping lights, I know I've got a, a hardcore bar, like light bar set and it's a rigid bar set. And I love That's it. That's one of the original white yeah, ones the original, you've got, isn't it? Um, or do you have the orange? orange it's one? an orange one, yeah, because there's a three-colour version now. So that's the, when we talk about innovation, you used to have Great. like a white and orange bar light, which is what I've got. And now you've got one that's got three different colours, which looks like you've you've just kind of got a combination of the white and the orange in the middle to create this sort of warmer light. Yeah, but you can do that yeah. too on your bars. You just need sw- a new dimmer. Yeah, yeah. 
you, you're putting a sales pitch oh, on me. You're trying to make me buy a new dimmer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually quite like the orange light anyway because it's it's just better for night. But um, so on camp lighting, there's flexible strips and there's there's um, you know solid strips like this one I've got in front, which is what I've got. What's sort of more popular? Is it these solid sort of bar kits that, that you find sells more or is there a, like if, if someone, oh. I guess we're trying to clear it up for someone who is looking at getting 12 volt lighting, what, what would be their consideration? How would they choose? It all depends on their application. Like if they're, if they're doing a canopy fit out, um, guys will use the rigid bars. Um, we've got those flush mounted clips that make mounting very easy for that. Um, and the guy and people can hardwire it in as well, mm-hmm. so um, doesn't void warranty or anything like that. So they, they're used for that application. But then you've got your flexi strips and that they they're more compact. So people like that compact, and they then they can move them around to anywhere they want. They can use them at home if they're barbecuing or anything like that. So it just depends. It comes down to personal preference on space and what you know what they want to use it for. So. But all are fully waterproof as well. So, in any application, yeah, I've got um, a two point five meter flexi roll actually, and it's awesome because it's such a long strip. But of course, it packs mm. smaller than a dinner plate. You know what I mean? It just stuffs yeah. in a bag, so that's yeah. really handy to have. Yeah, this is the flexi I, like this. I find yeah. no, the ones that I've got is in the little pouch, and it's got like the the velcro straps, and it's oh, got okay. a sail track, sail track yeah. on it, and. Okay. Yeah, this is. I think this yep. is the stuff you stick straight yeah, to. Yeah, so something. that's kind of handy because you can it. permanently yep. stick in places. Yeah, and you can cut them as well, mm-hmm. right? You buy a one meter strip, you can. You yes. sure can. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So very versatile. Every thirty to fifty mil, you can cut them. Okay. So when it comes to actual sort of LED lighting, what makes a quality LED light? Like a, I know we shot you through a couple of questions here to get you prepped for the interview and Ben, <laughs> yeah. Ben's just scribbled this one. But what's the, yeah, how, you know, if you're someone who's new to, to lighting, what are you looking for in, in a lighting product? Um, I guess there's two real types of LED chips used in LED lighting. One's a 3528 eight chip and one's a 5050 chip. Obviously, 5050 chips are a lot brighter, um, and you can tell that immediately. We use a lifestyle light, which has a 3528 eight chip, and then we have our rigid bars, which use 5050 chips, and you can tell the, the brightness difference straight away. Okay, and is there any sort of, I guess, um way to tell the quality of the constructions and the lightings and and connections or anything like that? Or is it a fairly standardised thing across LED lighting? Well, I guess the Um, silicon coating would be one of them. Yeah, silicon coating over the lights. Some lights don't have any silicon coating at all. They're just basically a strip with the um, LEDs. LEDs chips on them, okay. Um, which obviously wouldn't work outdoors. It would get moisture and it would it would just stop working. Whereas lights coated in a silicon base will last a lot longer outside. They are completely waterproof. So you mean it's got um, – so with the, the uncoated ones, you can actually feel all the little – you can see there's a picture yeah, here. You can LEDs. feel the LEDs. But, but the, yeah. the bars, like I think, well, these bars here, if you take the cover off, you can feel a smooth silicon like it's actually filled with silicon. Yeah. In the, is that what you mean when you say yes. silicon? Coating, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. with the bars, it's more of a resin on it, the bars. It's an epoxy resin put over the top of the, the LED bar. Okay. Yeah. And with but with your flexible strips, it's a it's a silicon. Yeah, obviously. Because okay. obviously you need to be able to bend it and things yep. like that. So mm-hmm. So what about so they're chips, um fifty, fifty and three, two, I forget yep. the other one. Five two eight. Five two. Yep. Um they are, are they a Standard, like, is is there a fifty fifty chip that's a good fifty fifty chip and a cheap fifty fifty chip? I guess people who are looking at buying a twenty dollar light bar versus a fifty dollar light bar, is yeah. is there a cheaper chip in the fifty dollar one if if they both claim to be fifty fifty? Well, I, I don't know that question. That's above my pay grade. Oh, okay. So <laughs> yeah. on the spot. it is not usually <laughs> stated on on the product. They don't usually state what type of chip it is. Well, I get. I guess to. For an example, with a 50-50 chip, when they make an LED roll, the beginning of the roll and the end of the roll are very inconsistent, mm-hmm. and that's why we call the 50-50 chip because that's in the middle of the roll, and that's a lot more consistent and obviously brighter and things like that. So uh, right. generally, yeah, so that's how – that's more, a bit more technical, but generally the beginning and the end are, are going to be your, your cheaper inconsistent chips. 
compared to the middle of the roll. I okay. notice, uh, and in some of your products as well, you reference um, genuine Osram as well. Is that a, a, an actual recognised manufacturer versus maybe some other products that might not state where they're manufactured? And Cree as well. Osram oh, definitely. And Cree. Yep. Okay. Yeah, Cree and Osram. Yeah. Okay. Cree and Os- yeah, genuine Cree and Osram are generally your top of the line LEDs. Um, you've got Lumi LEDs, which we use in the BZRXs, a very quality chip as well. And there's multiple chips out there that are, you know, different brands. So okay. that might not be a 50-50. So, yeah. So mm. Korean Osram are actually the, the brand that manufactures yes. the chip. The LED. And when we say chip, yeah. we're talking about the LED or is the chip and the LED yeah. different? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, lot, same thing. Osram, lot, Osram is German, I think, and yeah. Cree is American. Okay. So there's quite a lot going on when you talk about a chip. Like each LED mm-hmm. is quite a lot going on in, yeah. a, in a very small amount of space yeah. there, isn't there? Which And an LED yeah, is yeah, definitely. Going, going back to when I studied electronic engineering for about a year before I gave Did up you? many, many years ago, um, straight out of school. Um, there's too much maths for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> light emitting diode, right, which um, – I'd like yeah. to think I could explain what it was, but um, there's there's a fair bit going on in each one of those little things, and there's lots of chips within a strip. If I look at this picture here, so each little square thing is a chip, right? Is that Correct. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So I'm get, probably getting a bit technical there. I reckon. I Let's, reckon we should sort of move on from our yeah, LED just, deep dive. Yeah. Um, yeah. Enlightening <laughs> my own, um, <laughs> answering yeah, my are. own deep questions, but. Let's move on to um, yeah. It, I think we get a really uh, one of our really common questions we get is like lux versus lumens and and things like that down around uh, lighting terminology. What is the difference between lux and lumens? Um, I guess the the main difference is lux is measured at the source of the light. So if you put a lux reading on a light, it'll give you say twenty thousand lux. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry, wrong, sorry way. wrong way. It's got lumens. <laughs> lumens is measured at the source of the light. Okay. So it'll give you a, a readout, say, 15,000 lumens, but it doesn't give you a distance on how far said light will go, and that's mm-hmm. basically the reason you're buying a light, right? You want to know how far you're going to see down the road. A lux is a measurement of, a measurement of light at a distance. So a one lux is usable light, meaning you could walk uh, 1,500 metres in front of your vehicle, open up a newspaper, and still read it. Okay. Right. Okay, so how much, I mean, it seems like the torches and things, a lot of things out there will just uh, almost sell based on having the most lumens or the highest numbers, but is that always relevant? Like how much does how much does someone reasonably need to do, to say get around the, the camp, a, a campsite with one tent and a vehicle in it? How many lumens do they reasonably need? Is that, well, is if that we're an talking about question? headlamp, yeah, if we're talking about headlamps, because you're not looking for big distance with a headlamp, it's yeah. more of that immediate area. Yeah. So, you know, anything a hundred plus is going to be ample for that mm. for those those areas there. Obviously, if we get into the hunting and um, you know the big fishing and things like where people want more of a spotlight and things like that, mm. therefore you're going to need a lot more lumens. But also, that's when you luck you want to know your lux reading as well because you're looking for that distance. Um, and that comes down to reflectors um, also, like with the driving lights. Reflectors help a lot getting that distance so, as well. So, so can, say on, a, on a, a focusable torch can have, say, 400 lumens, but does the lux then change with the focus? So, it will. So, it will. So, so, so yes. further, if you tighten that beam to a spot beam and you put a lux reading on a spot beam, it will be different to something on a flood beam. Okay, so lux and lumens aren't consistent side by side. You can have 400 lumens at however many lux, but you focus it, it's the same 400 lumens at a different lux. Am I correct there? Correct. Correct. All right. That's correct, oh, yeah. I've learned something new today. <laughs> Good cool. one. You love learning. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 100 lumens, I guess. Um, so for these type of bar lights here, they're diffused. So uh, how many lumens is that one? 295. 295. So if you say 100 lumens yeah. sort of just in a workable space, then 295 lumens from that is, um, I guess it's diffused around a, a, a local space. So if you've got two of those and two different Correct. spots on the campsite, it's probably plenty of mm. uh, lumens just to find your way around and work under. Absolutely, yeah, 100%. And when you guys are, um, like, for example, your spotlights, I know you've got um, some of your new ones that have come out. 
you talk about the lux being 450 metres but the beam distance, say, 900 metres. Is that something that you guys physically go yeah. out in the dark and test or, like, how do you work out beam distances and things like that? So, like, everything's sent to a lab where they do all the testing there. Mm-hmm. So everything's, yeah, so we, we do send it to a lab. So everything's stated on those boxes. Yep. Uh, 100% accurate it's, what we're talking about. It's all third-party tested, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and are those testing so, sort of um, standardised as well? Like I know with sleeping bags, for example, and sleeping mats and things like that, there's like standardised testing so you can easily compare brands and, and things like that. With lighting, is that yeah. the same the same sort of standardised testing as well? Well, yeah, it is. Yeah, it is because you know that what you know you can't alter that lux reading. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it is standardised for that. Um, going back to the beam distance, mm. um, you know, basically a beam distance is not usable light. So the light mm. will still travel, mm-hmm. but it's not usable light. Um, I guess, but some people like to know what the actual beam distance is. It's That's probably true. more of a marketing thing. Than yeah. anything like that. We so, do we do get a lot of questions from people around that. How far will my mm. light light up? Yeah. yeah. So, so, if it's so, many, so I guess the, there's the a lot of variables as well, is, isn't there? Yeah. So and the lux reading is really, you know, the one that I look at when I'm explaining to a customer. I don't really talk about the beam distance. It's purely that one lux reading. So. Yeah. So lumens is the is the one that's commonly put on products, though, isn't it? That, that's what we see the most. Is that lumens just because it's a bit more yeah. accepted? Yeah, yeah. Lumens was the old way of measuring light because they could never do a lux reading on a light before. Oh. So everyone used to just measure in lumens. It wasn't really until like two, three three years ago that people started measuring in lux because lux is what people really wanted to know. Yeah, I think we were one of the first companies yeah. that started yeah. to. Um, Bring out the lux reading, and we right. and I remember in a in a meeting there we made a it you know that we needed to educate the public on lux reading. So and, it did take and a what it years. meant and yeah. what it meant, yeah. So so okay. um in terms of things like um you know your RGB color temperatures, all that sort of stuff. How is that? Um, or does different color temperatures affect a lux rating or a, or a lumen output? Um, how does that sort of work in with things? Uh, different colour temperatures would affect a lux reading. Like on orange, for example, orange gives a lower lumen output to, say, a white light. Mm-hmm. So you would get a lower lux reading on orange light compared to white light. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming that's um, also why your orange lights is so effective at keeping bugs and stuff away. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They work on a on a three and a half, closer to 4,000 colour temperature. Okay. Um, Kelvin colour temperature. So yeah. they do they do work in reducing those bugs. And do you guys have with your sort of say your white range um, of camp lights, what sort of Kelvin do they sit at? They sit at about the five, five and a half thousand yeah. Kelvin. Mm-hmm. So they are a daylight white. Yep. Yeah. That's more on the blue side, isn't it? Uh, six and a half. Would six and a half is six yeah. to six and a half would be more on that okay. bluish. That's good to know. Light. So daylight's a slightly warmer, yeah, slightly yellower light. The five thousand that you were talking about. Yes. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the the color you so the, it was all right before in saying that the, you got that three color dimmer now. You haven't actually got a third color LED in there. You just it's just smart technology that kind of combines a bit of orange and a bit of white. So that uh, and it balances out that warm light. So you, you've got something in there that you know, you've got a, a, I guess a a um, Kelvin target that you want to reach, and you just balance them both till you till you meet that. Yep, correct, one hundred percent. Yeah, it just activates both white and orange on at the same time, and to make it either a warmer orange or a or a whiter orange, you dim the white down, turn the orange up, or vice versa, you dim the uh, dim the orange down and turn the white up. Okay. Cool. Can I take a yeah. step back? Because I've still I've got all these questions in my head still. <laughs> this right, this bar here, right? So you've got this is your um what is it, 40, uh, 30 something centimeter light bar. It's yep. 295, 25, yep. 295 lumens, but you don't have a lux measurement on this. So either either that or I haven't looked hard enough to to find it. So what lux does this 
deliver? And is it relevant to a light bar like this or is it more a focus light that Lux is relevant with? It's yeah. more of a focus light that more, it's more relevant yeah, to. Yeah, I guess more for driving. You want to know how far you're going to see around okay. a campsite. That you don't really need to know what a, a one lux reading is on a on a light bar underneath an awning. Okay. Oh, sorry. This one's got got a meeting. So yeah. seventy six yeah, meters. Well. So you got one. So you've got you. So this is saying seventy six meters at one lux. So you could sorry. read a newspaper yeah. seventy six meters at away seven, from that light. Yeah. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah correct. Hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. That clears it up. All right. I'm. That, is up that question in my mind. <laughs> is there any particular science to working out how much area of lighting that you're going to get? Because, you know, I've worked in customer service for a long time and a lot of people are like, well, there's one metre light bar and 30 centimetre light bars and 40 centimetre. How much bars do I need to light up my area? Is there a way of working that out? Well, generally with our light bars, <laughs> a forty-eight. Uh, yeah, it will. Well, it will depend on what brand of light they're buying. Like if we're talking about the hardcore brand, yep, um, a forty-eight centimeter light bar that will do a three three by three meter gazebo, no problem at all. Okay. It'd be more than an efficient mm-hmm. enough light. Um, a one meter bar is like can do a, a six by three. Yep. Um, so if you go by that gauge, um, it gives you a pretty good. Understanding, like we get a lot of guys doing canopy fit outs and they want to put a one metre bar on. Yeah. They really don't need it. A 48 centimetre is more than sufficient. More than enough. enough. Yeah, okay. right. So, okay. I guess, yeah. I guess the consideration. Yeah, but obviously there's different bars. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the consideration there is though you've got one bright bar on one side of the gazebo, but it might actually be more useful to, to have two shorter bars on each side of the gazebo. Um, and that's like you sell sort of two, four, and six bar light kits, and I've only got a two bar kit, but I quite mm. like just having one bar under my awning and one bar at the back of my car, so I've got light in both places. But overall, I've got combined more lumens just in two different spots. So mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's the and, that, and that's a beauty. Oh no, go on, Steve. Sorry, <laughs> we got a bit of a delay <laughs> oh, with it. So <laughs> and that's and that's the beauty of the 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 camp kits that we have, the twos, the fours, and the six is that you can customise it to however you want to use that. Like, as you were saying, have one over the kitchen area, one over the table area, one yeah. in the bedroom, um, and that's a beauty. And I, and that's why I like the 48-centimetre bars because you can spread that, I guess, spread that light out yep. to a lot more, to cover a lot more area. And you can keep adding to them. So if you start off with two, you can just add yeah. another one if you decide you want to And it speaking of adding, yeah. is there a, a limit to how many you can daisy chain on a single strand at all? Yes, yes. So the dimmers on their own, they're I think they're about a 3.7 amp rating. Mm-hmm. So that'll run close to five 48 centimetre bars mm-hmm. um, in one series and then you use those two-way or three-way splitters to, to branch off and then again you can run another five and another five. It's just the dimmer that limits how many you can run after that. Okay, that's interesting. So you can run another five for each splitter that you use? Each splitter, yeah. yeah, yeah. So off a three-way splitter, you could have three dimmers and then run fifteen bars. Does that come down to the whole so, inline and uh, parallel kind of setup? Is that is that how the science behind it works? More, more the amperage going through that dimmer. Through the dimmer, the right. dimmer can handle up to three point seven amps of power going from your battery to your dimmer switch. Mm. Your bars, I think, are about 0.6 of an amp. Mm-hmm. Okay. So speaking um, of amperage and things like that what's the easiest way to calculate your power consumption like if you're someone who's new to it and you're not really Mm. familiar with maybe how to do it yourself is there sort of a bit of a an easy way do you reckon um for say for example you're running a camp light kit off a a car battery Mm -hmm. um your car battery is usually about 80 to 100 amp hours but it's not really that 80 to 100 amp hours it's 50 percent of that yeah right so really say it's a 100 amp hour battery you've got 50 amp hours of usable power Mm -hmm. if i'm running if I'm running a four-bar camp kit, we'll say it's 0.5 of an amp. That's two amps an hour there for four bars, and I'm running that off a 50-amp-hour battery. Yeah. It's going to give me 25 hours yeah. of power. Mm-hmm. That's that's how I work it out. Okay, so it's it's literally just a matter of adding up all your amp hour power requirements yeah. and then dividing that by the usable yeah. amp hours you got in your battery. Because they're really yeah. low. Correct. These yeah. are like point. 
or point two amps per hour for this bar here. So yeah, you're gonna yeah. get pretty, if you ran one of those off of a hundred amp hour really. AGM, you're gonna get days of use out of it. If you correct felt like yeah. running it nonstop for that time. So talking also oh. on um running things off your car battery and, and having full lighting setups and stuff, at what point do people need to consider getting a secondary power source, do you think? Is is that something, if if realistically you're only running lights as, as your only 12-volt appliance, is a secondary yep. power system necessary? No. Okay. No, I don't think so. It, it's not until you start running fridges mm. and, and things like that if you want to um, start powering, you know, 12-volt fans or, or things like that. It's always better to have an auxiliary battery. That way that power draw starts to, to get up there. Um, your fridge, your lights, and then you charge mobile phones. You want to run 12-volt fan in summer. Mm -hmm. It starts to get up there. So that's when you would more go down the, the line of an auxiliary battery. Yep. And realistically, all people are needing for their light setup is is their twelve volt cigarette output in their car, basically. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just flicking through our questions here, um, I think we've uh, answered a heap of them just in conversation. Um, we've got one here about flexibility in your ecosystem. What's con considered with developing your range, but you've sort of covered that by, um, I say, you take a lot of customer feedback, but obviously those. Bars up to six bars, um, you know, for flexibility and setup. But do you stop at six because usually that's kind of the limit at which that that dimmer can handle? Uh, no, there's two dimmers in a six bar kit. It's really the amount of light that is in that kit. I guess no one really needs more than a six bar yeah. camp kit. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's quite, quite a lot of light. Yeah, I mean, I've got two, and I've got a family of four, and it gives me more than enough light yeah. to, to get around the campsite. So. Yeah. A, yeah, yeah, six six of those bars would be tons of light around the campsite. Yeah. Um, In terms of now, I, I want to talk about four wheel drive lighting because I personally don't have a four wheel drive, but we've just bought a Sprinter van and we drive everywhere. And most of the time, we drive at night because we can't get away till after work. And in South Australia, if you want to go anywhere peaceful, you have to drive for a long time. So. Um, <laughs> What sort of is really the difference between like your driving lights and your spotlights and your light bars and, and things like that? What Like, yeah, what do you actually need if you're doing a lot of country driving or rural driving at night? Well, I guess, well, it will come down to what type of driving you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so if you live in the hills and things like that, mm -hmm. um, I think my preference would be a light bar. A light bar is not going to give you as much distance, but it's got a lot of flood on it as well. Mm -hmm. So um, so you're not really needing, especially if you're going up windy roads, you don't need that distance. Um, you don't want that hot spot mm -hmm. just on a tree. You want to be able to see to the sides of the road. Um, but if you're doing a lot of country driving where you've got a lot of straight roads, mm -hmm. of, you know, your spotlights, yeah. Your BZRX 180s or 7 inch or 9 inch, I should say. Yeah. Um, it's going to give you a lot of distance down the road. So you can see further down the road. But also with, with your spotlights too, they might not give you that immediate flood at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But as they go further down the road, that will expand out okay. and give you that vision on okay. the sides there. So it will just really come down to what type of driving you're doing. Um, some people go for both yeah. uh, a light bar and driving lights. That would sort of um, cover you really in in more most situations then. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. gives you the best of both worlds. You do get the best distance, and you also do get the best flood as well. Is there any? I've I've seen also a lot of variation in how people mount their lights. Some people do them right down low on their bull bar. Some people put them up on their roof racks. Is there any um, benefit or or you know pros or cons to either of oh. that? Well, I guess if you put it up on your roof rack, you, you you're going to get a bit more. I think. And personalize yeah. it, you get more spread mm -hmm. um, from the top there. But generally, yeah, look, you know, with, with our range of lights, um, it doesn't matter what range of lights you put on of your hardcore brand, they're mm. gonna they're gonna suit everyone's needs, that's for sure. they they've come a long way from what, five, six years yeah. ago when we first started doing light bars. Mm. So traditionally um, light bars when we started were giving you probably a max disc distance of about 180 metres. Mm -hmm. uh, now they're pushing close to eight or 900 metres out oh, of the light bar yeah, right. and still giving you that flood as well. So technology is moving very fast. Um, yeah, it's it's quite exciting. 
It's a bit like computers, isn't it? Early days, every time you you're almost buying uh, technology yeah. that's that's already well in in advance in their research phase. When you when you're getting it off the shelf, there's already better things being produced. Yeah. But yeah, you can always. Yeah. Um, can always be upgrading. Question about the um, the spotlights. I know I've got some old spotlights on my car, which are the old, I assume it's halogen, and each spotlight does yep. something different. One's a flood, one's kind of a beam. Are these the same? Do, do they both offer a different light? Because when you look at them, yes. like they've got all these LEDs in the front, but they like you can visually see the difference between the ones I've got. This one you, you can't. Mm. Are they sort of set up differently? Yeah, no, both lights are a combination. So – with the old halogens, you had like a you had a floodlight. Um, even HIDs, you had a floodlight and a spot mm. to to give you your distance and your flood. With technology these days, um, with that particular BZRX light there, that's a combination. So once you turn them on, um, you're getting plenty of width, but also getting plenty of distance out of it as well. So okay, and the so specific- there's no need for the two different um, lights. So. The specifications on your lights as well, I'm assuming if they come in a pair, the specifications apply to the pair and they're not the individual lights. Correct. Yep. Correct, yeah. yes. Yeah. Is And is there any consideration with how many lights you're allowed to mount to your vehicle legally that you're aware of? Well, every state's got, a, every state's got their own laws. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it comes down to the individual of, you know, looking up their state laws and what they can and can't have. It comes down to the Australian design rules, the ADR, and you can click on your state and they will tell you how many lights you can mount on on your vehicle. I think there's rules around whether you can mount it, like bull bar rules as well. Like, um, I don't think you can have things sticking out above a bull bar and, and all those sort of things. So I guess that's a good In point. In your eye vision of your, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's um, – um, It's. Sorry, Zach, what did you say that was just the ADR, did you say? ADR is the Australian Design Rules, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll put a link to that in the show notes Looking as well. Up. Yeah. yeah. Um, a question I on, think in Queensland, yeah. No, no, you yeah, go, right. I'm changing topics, so you. I, I think in Queensland we can have up to six lights on the front of the vehicle. That includes your, your headlights at the front, so you can add four four more. Which is an awful lot of light, right? <laughs> it is, when you think about it, it's I, four more spotlights or light bars on the front of your vehicle. I, I don't even use my spotlights very often, usually because I try and get to camp well before dark. But the last time I turned them on, we yeah. did get to the camp when it was dark. I've had the car for like 11 years and I realized the spotlights are all out of focus and they're pointing up into the sky and, <laughs> and it didn't really do anything. So I don't really use them that much. But um, but a, a question on the, the installation side of it, I guess probably more so for the driving lights than these sort of camp lights because these are very much plug and play. They come with a cigarette yep. um, lighter adapter um, or even a, you can adapt it to mirror and just plug it in anywhere on your car. Um, but with the driving lights, um, I know you've got plug and play kits and that sort of thing available, but how, like for someone who's never done it before, just bought a four wheel drive and wants to install them, do they have to have a little bit of knowledge before they sort of buy these and just put them on the car? Like, is there any safety considerations to make sure they don't burn yeah. the car down? And definitely, if you know, if you've got a bit of, bit of knowledge, you'll be able to work it out and fit it yourself. But generally, we tell people if you're not too sure, best thing to go is to an auto electrician and let the experts do it. Especially with a lot of the new vehicles these mm-hmm. days as well. Um, we do have a range of pity back connectors that are making life a little bit easier. But also, once again, with Cars changing and new technology, keeping up with different adapters is is a is a problem as well at the moment. So, yeah, okay. um, but yeah, but definitely, I always advise if you haven't got any idea, just leave it to the person that knows about it, or electrician. Uh, you've got all the wiring harnesses included in the kit, so you're saving money there. Mm. It will just be the labour for the auto electrician. So they all fused and everything in, in here? Are their fuses included with all the kits? Sure or are. Are they? Okay. All yep, right. you've got your you've got your rocker switch. So it comes it comes as a complete kit. So your fuses, your rocker kit, uh, rocker switch, sorry. Um, you know, basically hand that over to the oil electrician. You know, within an hour he'll have that all fitted and you'll have no problems and you're on your way. Yeah, right. I guess for older cars it's pretty easy because the bat- working out where the battery or well, the electrical system goes is pretty straightforward, but newer cars, yeah. I guess, if you don't get it right, you can end up damaging 
things in the car and then crawling off to you. You're smiling at me like I'm I am only from because I'm, I'm remembering uh, when my little brother bought an old school Land Rover and he realised that he could watch YouTube and yep. put m- electrical mods on his car <laughs> and all these lights he got off eBay and he was always out there like plugging me <laughs> with it. I don't know, it just made me think about that. But if you don't get it, if you don't get it right, and the new cars are right. You can damage things in the actual car, and then you then you're sort of going to your electrician with a tar between your legs, saying I've messed it up. <laughs> yeah, because so. yeah. they're all fitted with computers now. Every every new car's got a computer inbuilt, so it's um it does make it a little bit hard with the newer vehicles attaching piggyback adapters and wiring harnesses and feeding the rocker switch through the firewall as well. That's that's a difficult job too. If you don't know where your little silicon O-ring and all the wires feed through, it's it, it, there's a lot to know. Yeah. yeah. Even when you do know where that O-ring is, it's a pain in the bum getting another cable through there. Yeah. Anyway. They're usually that tight. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah. do you guys have um, yourselves like auto electrician backgrounds or do you have people at Hardcore with that? primary background at all oh we have yeah we do have a few people here with that type of background so yeah so they lead us in the right direction what are you looking at me for (laughs) (laughs) i try i generally try and get one of the guys to just yeah fit it all up for me so um but we've all had to have a go at doing it so um we do have a a general knowledge of it all so okay but just with like zach said with the new cars it it pays to just go to someone that's done their apprenticeship and knows what they're doing. So yeah, um, it's a lot safer option. Good advice. So have you guys got cars loaded with like light bars on the roof rack and pushing the boundaries sure of do. how many lights you can have on the front and just for the look? Yeah. Or do you actually use it? Just for the look. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just just because it looks good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I think I, I think I can't we can. I, I I got my car from um, Steve. It was a hand me down car when he got his new company car. And I was so excited. I'd never had a company car before. And I get the two big driving lights on the front and I got a light bar down below and went to turn them all on. And I'm like, oh, that's cool, but where's my flood? Went out and Steve never connected the light bar. (laughs) (laughs) It just looked good. It It just looked good. It's an ornamental light bar. (laughs) (laughs) Really, it's just for the look. Because to be quite honest, all you need, is just one set of lights operating and it's more than enough. So yeah. I had the BZRX yeah. 215s and 9 inches on there yeah. and I didn't really need anything else. It was all for looks. Yeah. I think I, I think Rodney was saying once well, that he, he yeah. lights his car up like a Christmas tree for all the kids on the street, like yeah. a as a party trick, yeah. cruising up and down the street. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rock lights underneath. And yeah, nice all that sort of jazz. Yeah, nice. I, I'm out of questions. Uh, I've learned heaps today. Have you got anything else, Lauren? Um, generally, just sort of having a quick look through the list here. Basically, do you, is there any sort of best practice, maintenance, sort of, you know, longer term care tips for your, your 12 volt lighting systems, be it your vehicle or your campsite, or any checks you should do on them or any, anything like that? I think the biggest thing is before you go out, Make sure camping it that or you whether it be the solar blanket or uh, lighting or your fridge, make sure that everything's you know working before you get out there instead of finding out when you get there that you've got a problem. So, yeah. but um, that'd be the make sure your auxiliary battery is fully charged. Yeah. You don't want to get out to camp and your battery is half discharged and you're running your fridge and your lights, you won't get long out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but as for care for 12 volt lighting there's there's no real no real care apart from making sure they work yeah. Yeah. i know for my light bars you, you you're um not your lifestyle kit but the 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 sort of top shelf kits that you've got come with a like a little case that they all go in and i i case. keep mine in that yep. and uh i've i've never done any maintenance on it i just pack it back up in there each time it's it's all foam mm. filled so it's all protected and I, I don't check it before I go out, but I guess I don't feel like I need to because I've packed it away neatly mm. and they're, they're, you know, made durably. So, yeah, I've not had any issues with them. My uh, only other question would be with your camping lighting range specifically, is there any considerations to having them permanently mounted but externally, like, say, light bars? Um, well, you probably need to watch that space. There might be some that – is coming out. That's a different product to those light bars. <laughs> that will be external. Yeah. Okay, that's so, awesome. Um, I, I don't news. know if the directors will shoot me for that one, but watch that space. We've got some like we've got some awesome new products coming out, 
And that one is not too far away. No, nah, that's okay. great because uh-huh. we've um, uh, my partner's built this roof rack system on our van, but just the sort of way we use it, he's like, I want to mount some lights permanently on the roof rack so we can get sort of certain areas outside the van lit up with just our style and all our kids and all that sort of jazz. And I was like, oh, I'm not really sure about that, so I'm so excited. That's all the podcast uh, is so about. The, I'm, I'm so um, excited about the watch this space thing. Yep, this will make his day. Okay. We're, we're really just here on this podcast to find out all the things for our own setups. <laughs> That's what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I love the um, the little, I think it's a, is it a little 60-watt floodlight the little cube floodlight thing yeah, that cool. you do. And I was like, yeah, I really want that yeah. light, but I want it to be dimmable and you you don't make a dimmable one of those. Um, you can have a dimmer to that. Can you really? You, did you know that? Uh, yes, you can. I have uh, actually phoned and asked and been told that you couldn't. Okay. Oh, that's well, so awkward. You can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a little thirty watt square. Yeah, that's on the light. it's on the little swivel mount thing, and it's a little little cube. Oh, yeah, that. yeah. Add a uh, it's a core dim. Add a core dim to it. Yep. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. that right. actually yep. makes me really excited now. Or if you if you want to get if you if you do want to get tricky, you can even put the remote control dimmer on and off on it as well. Get out. When are, when yeah, are yeah. they going to be compatible with the orange and white? By the way. Those remote dimmer switches. Watch, watch that space. Ew. Are you done with all your own nah. setup questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I, I think I'm out of questions. That was really good, and I hope our um, uh, our listeners find it useful. But thanks for joining us uh, on that topic today, guys. It's been really insightful um, coming from experts in the field. Um, really appreciate you being here. Right. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, guys. All right, guys. Well, that's it for another episode. Like we said at the start of the show, make sure you uh, subscribe by YouTube. Uh, jump in on the conversation on the Snowy's uh, Camping Show Facebook group where if you've got any questions on top of today's episode or ideas for a future episode, let us know. If you've got any questions for Hardcore, let us know. We'll get uh, Zach or Steve to answer it for us. Um, and stay tuned for another episode next week. Thanks, Catch you guys. later. See you later. Bye.